Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. It's winter time on a Wednesday afternoon. We have plenty of snow on the ground, and we've got another, I don't know, what is it, 10 to 12 inches starting now and continuing through the night. Winter storm warning here in Ellensburg, for goodness sake. So the local time is 1.47 in the afternoon, and we will begin our program on near-trench magmas at 2 o'clock. So that's, you know, that's, that's 13 minutes from now. I started a couple minutes early because I saw that we have more than 200 people already who've been waiting to get started with this. And uh, also, it's been two and a half weeks since we've done this, so I can't remember half the stuff I'm supposed to do. So, um, one second. That volume is off. This volume is off. Hopefully, my volume is on. So let's say hi to a few folks and also, of course, ask, are we five, uh, five by five here uh, for the first show after a long break? Geologically speaking, that's Todd in Southern California. You see it says five by five and uh, Northwoods 3D from Northern Wisconsin, five by five as well. Let me slow down the chat, boy. Okay, going way too fast. So I'm going to scroll back here and just say hi to a, all sorts of folks. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, Lawrence is in Meridian, Idaho. I'm back a ways. Uh, Jim's in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Simon Eich Tolgenbach from Tolga, Norway. Hello, Simon. Bernadette finally got a chance to watch live. Well, welcome, Bernadette. Matthew's in uh, Connecticut. Five by five, he says. The Geek is in Alabama. Kamloops, BC, that's Pamela. Kevin's in Fall City, uh, Washington, USA. Oscar's in San Diego. Oscar, five by five so far. Running on empty from snowy Wisconsin. John, uh, yeah, okay. Kent uh, Taylor from McKinley, T McKinney, Texas. Come on, boy, I'm rusty. I got to pick up the pace. I got a lot of people to say hi to. What are you doing? Jeff's in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, Little Bear is in Flagler County, Florida. Scrolling now, Terry's in Bend, Oregon, Maryland, Austin, Texas, Webb, Wisconsin, Webb Lake, Wisconsin, Redmond, Oregon. Oh, I'm down to live. Automatic scroll. Warden, Washington, Milwaukee, Oregon. That's a suburb of Portland. I always feel like I have to say that. Marumbina, Melbourne, uh, Australia. Hello, Ian. Gordon's in Glasgow, Scotland. Scrolling back again, I missed a bunch. Navarre, Minnesota. Eastern Kansas. Dennis is in Dorset, UK, the Jurassic Coast. Dave's in Bremerton, Washington. Heidi's in Hood River, Oregon. It's always a thrill, always a thrill to see everybody here. Harlan, Iowa. San Francisco Bay, uh, California. Vienna, Austria. Hello, Crown House. Kirk from Philomath. Alberta Gary's with us. Lac du Flambeau, Wisconsin. Hello, Gene. Backcountry Gary is at Mount Baker Ski Area. Yeah, man, that's a place to be on an afternoon like today. Gary, I'm great. You must have wireless in the lodge or something. I don't know. Or cell coverage up on top. Or maybe you're skiing, Gary, as you're, as you're watching and typing. What? Garrett, the Dutch night owl from the Netherlands. Norley is still in Ecuador. Amazing person, amazing videos. Itchyboots.com. Okay, uh, yeah, it's 1.50. I do have a couple of quick stories. And I guess thank yous. Uh, Varde, Denmark, hello. Carolyn is in the UK. Red Lester's in London. Bruce is in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Erie, Pennsylvania. Of course, I can't stop. Okay, come on, boy. Come on, boy. All right. So um, I didn't do anything over the break. 
Well, that's, that's, that's not true. So I love working on this stuff. I just, I just love working on this stuff, especially early in the morning, before everybody else is up. Our, our house was filled with, filled with family, but uh, everybody sleeps in, and I'm up at 4.30 or whatever. So, you know, I'm, I'm emailing geologists on Christmas morning. <laughs> I know it sounds like I'm a monster, and I would, like, put a preamble to the email. I know this sounds weird. You know, I know, I know it's weird. I'm emailing you on Christmas, but nobody's up yet, and I want to I get a few things done. So, with that said, uh, the only thing I did officially for my kind of outreach, quote-unquote, a lot of quotes already, is I did a couple of audio podcasts. I don't know if you listen to the audio podcasts that I do, but they're kind of a complement to what we're doing here, and I think it's different than what we're doing here. And this is a first. I got a package yesterday here at school from somebody who listened to those two audio podcasts that I did, like, right before New Year's. And all I'll say is, thank you. I got a big kick out of it. I was in the mail room. Somebody else is in the mail room, you know. And I'm just, start, I'm just laughing hysterically. And they're like, what's up with you? And I'm like, well, check this out. I got a red ear turtle shell mailed to me. I think it's fake. <laughs> but on one of those podcasts... Radio episodes, I call them. I had an idea for an analogy that we're going to use in February. Uh, but I'm going to use this turtle shell. So thank you, whoever. No, there was no note or anything, but thank you. I got it. Got the turtle shell. And speaking of stories over the break, we have time for this? Yeah. Okay, I, I already forgot now. Uh, so I'm... I'm I'm, I'm five by five, first of all, double checking. I won't have to think about it again. We're good there. Lappy, working okay. We doing okay there? Because I'm about to do the old switcheroo. I want to use the iPad, and to do that, I need to... Thank you. I'm, I'm going to get the power out of the laptop gently. Come on. I'm using the other port to plug in the iPad. Don't have a frozen phone. Okay, so can I switch over? Yes, I can. So have you, well, first of all, it's 27 degrees, winter storm warning. We've already covered that. Uh, for you early arrivals, let me uh, share with you that we're back to our two sessions a week, and that will be the case all through January and February. So we'll get to Z. We'll get to the end of the alphabet, February 19th. That's where we're headed. But that's not why I wanted to go to the iPad before we started. Have you seen this clip before? I'm going to play it, and I don't know if... Oh, I forgot to email the guest. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, coming back. I got to email our, our guest. Jeez. So busy with my stories and everything. Give me a second. We do have a guest... And okay. It is um it is amazing how much you forget. You know, we've had a few weeks off and I've forgotten half of this tech ghost, tech tech stuff. It's crazy. We got more than 500 already? Wow. Okay. Back to the iPad. Um, actually, no. So I'm going to play this clip for you. I don't know if you can hear the sound or not. There's a bad word in it. Uh, but I want to show you the clip. And some of you, if you follow me on social media, know why I'm showing the clip. But anyway, uh, here we go. So I won't say anything because I don't know if you're going to hear this audio or not. It might be loud anyway. Here we go.
Actually, tell me if you can hear this. Can you hear me talking right now in the video clip? No audio. Okay, good. Good. So I've got this on a loop. So I don't know how many of you have seen this before, but you'll notice that this was filmed uh, 10 years ago. 10 years ago. And it's the first day that I was out. It was, it, I think it was 100 degrees. And I was out with Tom Foster, rest in peace. And Tom and I filmed the first, was the first attempt. Can I get rid of the pause thing? Why is the pause thing on? There. So people seem to really like this clip, and I've shown it off and on over the years, where we hike out to this remote place near Othello, Washington. These are some basalt columns. It's got nothing to do with today's program. But we lugged a ladder out there. We lugged audio equipment out there. It was just two guys. We didn't know what we were doing. We set everything up, and I took my hammer, and down the crack it went. And I didn't have another hammer, and Tom really wanted me to use a hammer to bang on those rocks. So we went home, and we came back the next week, and I brought another hammer, and we, we finished working on that episode. And that hammer has been down that 50-foot crack for 10 years. For 10 years. Until Christmas Eve, I get an email from a guy named Andrew, who lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hang on, i got to stop this. And so Andrew and sends me this email and says, uh, got something I want to drop off at the house. Are you at the house? Can you give me your address? I'm driving from Albuquerque to my parents' house in western Washington. And I, I just entered Washington. I want to drop this off. Andrew from Albuquerque went out to that exact spot, brought printouts from the video, figured out which crack I dropped the hammer into 10 years ago, and I posted a little video of Andrew explaining to me that the entire hammer was buried in sand. It was probably loose, like windblown silt that went down the crack. But he said everything was buried with the hammer except for just this very uppermost part. And Andrew's a computer engineer. And at the time, he was living in Tri-Cities, Washington, working for a national lab. A uh, nat national lab. And he brought out a bunch of, what did he call them? Hard drive magnets, I don't even know what that is, but a bunch of very super powerful magnets on a string, lowered them down. He says the magnets grabbed onto the end of my hammer. He had to work the hammer back and forth, pry it out of the sand, as he calls it, and got it up. And the punchline is, he did this in 2017. So I can finally share my secret which is, I regularly take students out to that crack. They want to see the crack where I drop the hammer. And between 2012 and 2017, I would show them just a part of the hammer that we could see down there. And a few came back out with magnets and they tried to get them out, but they weren't Andrew. But Andrew got the hammer out of there in 2017. And since that time, in the last five years, when I take groups out there, we look down and they say, I don't see the hammer. And I'm like, here's the secret. Somebody took that hammer. Somebody got it out of there. Way down there, they got it out. But I, have, I keep waiting for somebody to tell me they have it. Well, Andrew, the pandem pandemic happened. Uh, before that, he was waiting for just the right time to present this hammer to me at a public lecture, and that didn't happen. In the meantime, Andrew moved to Albuquerque and packed up all his boxes from Tri-Cities, including the hammer. <laughs> the hammer was down in Albuquerque for a couple of years or whatever. Anyway, that's the long story. And uh, Andrew uh, from Albuquerque, thank you for returning the hammer. And uh, that's my little story, a Christmas miracle, as I call it. Now it's already after 2 o'clock. Okay, we have uh, 700 people with us. Uh, here's to you for joining us. Would you give me one extra minute to get my head right now that I've shared that story?
and we will begin talking about near trench magnets. Thank you. Hot mic. Okay, our guest is there. I saw him in the green room. So I see you, guest. That's good. I'm glad you're with us. I'm off camera. I'm mumbling to myself. Oh, you can do this now, boy. You're talking about near trench magnets. You can do it. Game plan, what is it? Right. We're going to talk about that. And then that. Yep. Okay. Oh, I think you can do this. I believe in you. I think you can do this. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm so glad that you're with us on this snowy Wednesday afternoon here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA. We've been off for a couple of weeks, two and a half weeks to be precise. And we're back to our Wednesday afternoon, Saturday morning schedule, and we will be with that schedule the rest of our time together as we work our way towards Session Z. This is the crazy Eocene A to Z. And that's fine, that's fine, that's the plan. But I, I, I do feel like I want to give you a general sense for the next month and a half. I do have a general plan. Most of this month, January, will be devoted to magma. And we know that magma is just one of the Eocene fireworks that we've been talking on before the break. Can't remember who sent me this last year, but thank you very much for that. Need I remind you that we have our Cretaceous fireworks, our crazy Eocene fireworks. I said Cretaceous, wrong. The crazy Eocene fireworks. And I'm, the first message today is that much of the month of January will be devoted to this chalice magma thing. And so our guest today is a key person to help us understand how these chalice magmas are different than other magmas. And he's going to come back. I'll tell you that right up front. He's going to be back. We need him more than today. He's going to be, come, be coming back again in two weeks. That's the plan. Um, but before we uh, end the alphabet series, I do want to get to these guys as well. The crystalline core and these metamorphic core complexes. So that's February. So generally, this, week, this month is magmas, is magmas and ocean plates, even though I've tried to avoid thinking about ocean plates. I have to deal with ocean plates a little bit. And then February, these mysterious rises of these metamorphic rocks, these metamorphic core complexes, this exhumation business in the crystalline core, and so on. Okay, so that's the plan, generally. And before we quit, I'll show you the uh, schedule of sessions. But again, it's easy to remember, Wednesdays and, and Saturdays. Wednesday afternoons at 2, Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And I've noticed that many of you have uh, gotten yourself caught up. You know, the holidays were a busy time, but I, I, every few days I check the view numbers, and, and we're up to, you know, whatever it is, 12,000, 13,000 views for most of those videos now in the series. So congratulations and thank you for your interest you're, you're up to speed and you're ready to go. We did do some things before the holiday break that I do want to revisit today. So what we really are doing two things today. Uh, the first thing we're doing is reminding ourselves of a couple of themes that we established with a and fireworks, both back in the Cretaceous time related to Rangelia, and a more recent story with Eocene and the rustic sourdough, which was moldy this morning, I just realized, so I threw it in the garbage. I was going to use the rustic sourdough again, but I guess you can't keep a loaf of bread in an area for three weeks without problems. Doi! Ultimately, our guest is going to help us see some key differences between magmas generated by subduction to create a volcanic arc versus... Magmas that are somehow generated in something called a slab window. 
And that includes some of these things called near-trench magmas. So that's the new wrinkle today. So it's a combination. It's a one-two punch today. The first punch is going back before the break and kind of resuscitating some of those themes. The second punch is brand new ground with these brand new kinds of magmas that I need some help explaining. And our guest is the perfect person to do that. Okay? So, without further ado, we're going to go here and here, but I guess there is an ado. Huh? I guess there is something I want to do first. I went back to the, I'll show you. I went back to this grant proposal that was written a couple of years ago. The North Cascades team, the DREE team, you've met two-thirds of them now. Mike Eddy, Stacia, Stacia Gordon and Bob Miller. Stacia's coming in February. But you've met Mike and you've met Bob. We might get them back again. But I'm, I'm proud to report that after a month of doing this kind of stuff with you, portions of this grant proposal involving new research in the North Cascades of Northern Washington made more sense to me than they did a month ago. Feels good. I'm making progress, understanding some of this stuff. And I think we all are together. So one thing that I want to pull right out of the grant proposal is a nice way for us to review where we were. And if you have an excellent memory, you remember in our session A, there were these things called magmatic flare-ups that Mike Eddy in particular was very interested in, but Bob and Stacia as well. I took the time to write out these magmatic flare-ups. In other words, these plutons. We are talking about magmas today and much of the month. So please ignore that this is the state of Washington. That's, I'm just using a chalkboard here for space. It's got nothing to do with the geography of Washington. And I'll just do this verbally because you can see it more than anything else. In the North Ca okay, I said ignore Washington, but now I'm going to point to it. You can see, I think, can't you, that this is the state of Washington. Seattle's right here. And underneath all this text is eastern Washington that's full of snow right now. And in north-central Washington, right here on the map, I'm not looking at the text yet, is the North Cascades. I think we know where those are by now. Well, as the grant proposal is written, Mike and friends are saying, look, there are lots of plutons, there are lots of magma bodies in the North Cascades, and they fall into three generations. There are Cretaceous granites and other plutonic rocks, and even some volcanic rocks, I think, that are between 96 and 87 million years old. Examples, the Mount Stewart Pluton. I've heard of it. It's right the frick over there, man. Black Peak Pluton, Ten Peak Pluton, Seven Figure Jack Pluton. I don't know hardly anything about I don't even know where most of these are. I think Bob, in one of our shows, said the Ten Peak Pluton's up by present-day Glacier Peak Volcano. But I, I know almost nothing about these Plutons. But what's new to me, and really this is I'm trying to frame our discussion for the entire month of January, is realizing that we have three distinctly different flare-up events or magmatic um, generators in the Cretaceous during these times. In the Eocene, yeah, Eocene fireworks, the chalice magmas between 50 and 45 million years ago. Yeah, we're going to be here today. We're going to be in here much of the month. This is the crazy Eocene, is it not? And these four plutons are going to be studied carefully by the end of the month. But there's another batch that don't make any sense to me. And if you remember the Mike Eddy show, he said the volume of, this, of these plutons are a little bit wimpier in volume. He said these are very voluminous, very voluminous. So the magmatic flare-ups were monstrous in the Cretaceous and in the Eocene. And by comparison, Mike almost said it's kind of a push to even call this, this collection of plutons between 78 and 60 million years ago flare-ups. But there's enough of them, again, I don't know anything about these, 
And they're kind of in in-between times. I think Bob Miller said that. In between these two major uh, magnetic flare-ups, we have this kind of, I don't want to call it a minor event, but the, the big thing I'm trying to do for us here, Oscar, colored chalk, is that we have established, and this was on purpose, we have established before the holiday break that a major event was docking Rangelia and friends. You remember that? That's the foo, 100 million years ago. And then inland, from the docking of Rangelia and friends, the insular superterrain, we have a bunch of thrust faults and plutons. Is this truly a bunch of subduction-related magmatic arcs or something else? Up here at the top, we know the rustic sourdough is coming in. And these are happening shortly afterwards. The fireworks in the Eocene. Well, we had Cretaceous fireworks as well. If we jump back and forth between these two major magmatic flare-ups, this is the theme for this month. I'm yelling. I'm excited to be back with you. If we keep jumping back and forth between the Eocene and the Cretaceous, between Celestia time and Rangelia time, what kinds of parallels or super huge contrasts can we make between these plutons and these plutons, between these volcanics and these volcanics, between these gold and silver deposits and these gold and silver deposits, if there are any? And then what the hell happened here? To my knowledge, and I think to anybody's knowledge, there wasn't a major terrain accretion at this time, but maybe there was. I don't know. And we're saving Baja BC till next winter, so I, I don't want to go there, but to me this is intriguing. So we're going to be jumping back and forth between three major time frames, and it's all centered on the North Cascades. I hope you know that's why I'm doing this. I want to learn new things, but I keep asking myself, how is this going to help me better understand the North Cascades? And these three magmatic flare-ups is one way to do it. Now, another way to give you a visual for that, and I'm going to try to do this quickly, because I, got, I want to get to the, the, the content of our guest. This is going to go quickly, I hope, because it, it goes along with what I just said. Here's Rangelia on a map. This is 100 million years ago, right? Here's Celestia on a map. This is 50 million years ago, correct? Can you get a sense of what I'm trying to do? This is a map of the West. This is a map of the West. Here's our large igneous province offshore, Celestia. It's a local hotspot creating a local large igneous province. Greater Celestia, half of it's going to end up in Alaska called Yakutat. We know that. But going back to December, we talked about Rangelia potentially sitting on top of some hot spot, maybe down by the equator uh, uh, more than 200 million years ago. And it's not till 100 million years ago that this Rangelia hits. And if you remember the basal story, the basal tick-off appearance, he says, we don't even really have Washington and Oregon yet, 100 million years ago. And everybody, whether you are a mobilist or a fixist, whether you are a pro-Baja BC person or someone who just ignores the whole thing, and that's a lot of people, regardless of which camp you're in, everybody agrees that this Rangelia, which is a cold and complicated super terrain, insular in other words, that thing is docking at least Idaho, but probably Idaho in many points further south. So, Oscar, I'm going to use your colors here. What are these things? Oh, I'm getting. I'm. I'm fully excited now. So we're accreting Rangelia 100 million years ago. What's happening inboard? The green doesn't stand out that well to me. We have thrust vaults and plutons. Rangelia docks 100 million years ago. It's the same view from the side. Remember? Thrust vaults, this is the Bob Miller show. And plutons. 
rising. The age here is, I don't know, 96 to frickin' 87 or whatever it was. You got it? Just like the North Cascades thing, this is the kind of general, kind of big picture view of the tectonics, at least in my brain, for the Cretaceous plutons, the Cretaceous magmas, that are in many places in the American West, but especially in the North Cascades. Yeah, the Mount Stewart pluton, yeah. The Ten Peak and the Whatever Peak and the th Seven Fingered Whatever, Jack. Here. Now, for our discussion today, Red, how are we generating those magmas? Now, back in the Cretaceous, remember, we keep jumping back and forth. This is 100 million years ago. Are these magmas from subduction of an oceanic plate? I think that's the common company line. But I got questions in the Cretaceous. Where's the ocean crust to subduct to make those plutons if they are younger than the accretion of the insular superterrain? Are these magmas more of a slab failure story? Bob Hildebrand, where we break a subducting slab and mantle material, hotter material, comes welling up. Leave it alone. You know why? Because that's another thing I did when rereading when rereading the grant proposal, these guys are ignoring the Cretaceous. <laughs> I blame Basil. I'm interested in the Cretaceous really for the first time in a serious way. And these guys go, I don't think we're that interested in the Cretaceous. We're not going to spend much time thinking about the Cretaceous Plutons. Maybe because of kind of these major questions that I'm thinking about now, but probably a bunch of other reasons as well. But these guys are devoting most of their time to the other two. So, the North Cascades research team, the dream team, you know that I'm associated with them for the next few summers. They're not really going to be sampling Cretaceous, Rangelia-related plutons, but they are going to be spending a lot of time sampling the in-between times plutons. It's a super mystery to, I think, everybody, as well as the Eocene plutons that have been studied a fair amount already, but there are significant questions. Okay, let me continue with my story because I'm going to leave this because they're not going to spend much time thinking about it. But again, I think it's helpful to go back and forth between these two major events where the Plutons are on display in the North Cascades. If we have a more local hotspot, and we do, and a, therefore a more local terrain, and we do, it's Greater Silesia that's essentially 100% crescent basalt and other kinds of basalts, and we accrete that... I'm not going to do colors again. Yeah, we decided that there was thrust faulting. For sure, the Cowichan thrust, for instance, in British Columbia, between 51 and 49. But I've been thinking about this over the break, and I think I have a new message here. Are there plutons associated with the accretion of Silesia, like it appears there were plutons associated with the docking of Rangelia and friends? In other words, are there plutons generated from this collision? And you're like, well, of course there are. Look, there they go. There they are. Those are the Eocene plutons between 50 and 45. Well, these are all from extension, as I understand it. So I'm slowing down now to help us see that something funky is going on with these Eocene plutons. We're finally to where we will be the rest of the month. These magmas are weird. Yeah, the Golden Horn, the Cooper Mountain, the Duncan Hill, the Railroad Creeks. You have to look. I haven't even learned them yet. But they are rising... 
inboard of the docking of Silesia, but they are rising during an extensional time. EXT, an extensional time. Or more accurately, they are rising during a trans tensional time. Do you remember we did that with Aaron Donaghy before we quit talking about the Chumpstick weekend before the break? Trans tension is a combination of extending the crust, but also doing transform action. Remember the strike slip basin that your chum stick is sitting in? That was a trans-tensional basin. You pull the crust apart, but you also wrench it sideways. As far as I know, these Cretaceous plutons are not trans-tension. They are trans, trans, I always stumble on that, transpression. Why do I stumble on that? Transpression during the Cretaceous, that's a combination of compression and transform activity. Also wrenching, but it's a squeezing and shearing as opposed to an extending and shearing. So we're getting these Eocene plutons, is my point, with a different kind of a structural geology setting. It's not pure extension, but it's extension and also this transform activity. I got to add a couple more words, and I am having fun with, uh, with all this colored chalk, so thanks again, Oscar. Please recall. Uh, thicken. Can you read that in purple? I think you can. Many of our guests before the Christmas break kept talking about the Cretaceous being a time when we are adding to the thickness of the continental crust, at least here in the Pacific Northwest, but maybe much more regionally than that. Remember, Basil was tying this to forming, to, to kicking off the Rocky Mountains. But let's keep in mind that our Cretaceous story is a compressional story, even though there's some transform activity, but we are doubling the thickness? I don't know. We're adding to the thickness a significant amount. And what's the opposite of thickening? Thin the crust. So this Eocene magma time, which our guest is about to talk about, whatever, whatever the magmas, the, the magmas are weird. They have mineral assemblages that are weird. There's other things about this story that are weird. I'll just keep using that word today because it wouldn't take a month to, to really think about them. But the weird magmas are coming up between 50 and 45, generally when we are thinning the crust. And a lot of other stuff is going on as well. I can't hold it now. Remember, in the crystalline core, this will be February, we have this incredible going up the geologic elevator, the exhumation. I won't bother to write the word, but that's tied to this. And I'm fuzzy on it, but I think possibly some of the geologic down is after the docking of Rangelia. So am I all over the place? I don't think so. I think I know what I'm doing at the moment for a change. I might have to screenshot this one or do something. I don't want to erase this right away. I'll probably save it for the next couple of sessions, maybe. I don't know. But this is kind of our roadmap to realize how this local time is important to us. All right. I'm satisfied with that. Kind of reminding myself of what we have. You remember, I get a frozen phone uh, if I have too many things plugged in at the same time. So before we go to our guest, yeah, guest, give me 10 minutes and we'll be ready for you. Let's go to the iPad, and I want to share a couple things to kind of set up that discussion with our guest. Haven't really gotten to the near-trench magmas. You keep waiting for it, but I, I felt like that was, 
I hope that was a wealth, worthwhile um, review session to get us back in the flow more than anything else. Uh, okay, so I showed you this before. I think I have it on a loop. This is India colliding with Asia, but I want you to notice that there is a failure of the slab, a failure of the ocean slab that's happening right beneath. Do I have a pointer? Yeah. Oh. Pointer. I'm going to put the pointer right in here. Get the pause button out of there. Hey, get the pause button out of there. Thank you. Okay, I can't have the pointer then. I'll just keep this on the loop and show you and try to give it to you verbally that as, as soon as India, the continent of India, starts colliding with the continent of Asia, all I can do is use my words. Notice that that little, thin little ribbon of ocean floor detaches from India. And as it detaches, we're literally breaking the ocean plate down below. That's what I mean by slab failure. And obviously, if I'm introducing it right now, we're going to think about some of that in the next couple of weeks. Move on, boy. Oh, boy, we got our, our up at Mount Baker. Maybe he's still watching or in the lodge or something. Backcountry Gary has been busy sending me photos annotated by himself, Gary, backcountry ranger, long time. And the North Cascades is where we go. This is not Gary, but this is from the grant proposal. And do I have my pointer now, he asks himself. No, I don't. Um, the bright reds are the east. No, oh, is that true? The bright reds are the Cretaceous plutons in the North Cascades, Mount Stewart, Ten Peak, Black Peak, for instance. The oranges are the Eocene plutons in the North Cascades, Cooper Mountain, Duncan Hill, Golden Horn. Daddy's proud of himself. He starts to understand a few of these things. Remember, this photo really caught Mike Eddy's eye, where he said, I don't know where that is. I, I, we were trying to map where these two plutons, an Eocene pluton and a Cretaceous pluton, came in direct contact, and that's definitely what we have. Cretaceous on the left, potentially related to the docking of Rangelia. Eocene pluton on the right, potentially related to the collision and docking of Celestia. But again, remember, as I'm understanding it currently, I might get talked out of this, the pluton on the left is from a transpression scene, and the pluton on the right is from a transtension scene. Why are we making these magmas in a time when we're pulling the crust apart? That's our key question today. I mean, Gary's going nuts here with these photos, and all I'm doing as I'm looking at these photos for the third and fourth time is I'm thinking, okay, Rangelia or Celestia? Do you know what I mean? I'm thinking about the fireworks after the docking of either Rangelia in the Cretaceous or the Celestia in the Eocene. Now, to set us up specifically for our guest, we're going to visit a couple of places in western Washington, like Bald Mountain, and compare it to the Golden Horn, which is in eastern Washington. So this is not really in the Cascade. This is in western Washington. This is a place where we shouldn't even have magmas. It's kind of weird. Bald Mountain. Mount Pilchuck. Huh? Where are we? Hell, that's Everett, Washington. That's I-5 on the horizon. These are all Gary photos. Perluminous. Okay, now I'm getting queasy. I don't know what these words mean. Perluminous? Does that mean it's got a lot of aluminum? Oh, really? What's that mean? Who gives that? We're in the wheelhouse now of our guest. But roughly at the same time that we're getting magmas in western Washington, we're getting these crazy Eocene magmas in eastern Washington, like this beautiful photo of the Golden Horn Batholith up by Washington Pass, where I shot a video last September, if you happen to see that one. So we'll continue to get Gary's help. Midnight Peak Volcanics. I think those are Cretaceous. I think that's from Rangelia time. Okay. You saw our show with Ray Wells. And we focused on Celestia. What did we artfully avoid? 
during that entire show. We got a spreading ridge. Look at this thing. He's got a dashed or a dotted spreading ridge or a plate boundary coming right between these two ocean plates, the Kula plate and the Farallon plate, according to Ray Wells. And this thing is heading right for us. I focused only on the sourdough bread out in the water, purposely avoiding a plate boundary that almost certainly was centered under Greater Silesia. We're not going to look at the animations now, but when we finally dock Silesia, we have all sorts of Cretaceous fireworks happening inland. Okay, before I uh, unplug the uh, iPad for purposes of power, let me make sure that you all know that January and February, viewers, you are welcome to come back. We're going to be at this every Wednesday and every Saturday morning. There are the sessions in January. There are the sessions in February. It will be done February 19th. I'm not looking forward to being done. I'm having too much fun with this stuff. Okay. I'm unplugging the iPad. I'm going back. We're unplugging the iPad. Trying not to freeze the phone. Our guest is being very patient. Thank you for that. I got one more thing to set up our guest, and then we go to him. So it's official. I am now out of my comfort zone because I'm talking about places that I barely know and magmas that I barely know. But I want to remind you that our well-known Cascade Volcanoes, known as a modern volcanic arc, a magmatic volcanic arc, which looks like that, Right? Subducting oceanic plate, volcanic arc, magma's coming up from a subducting plate. We've all taken Geology 1 or at least read something online. We know what subduction looks like. We know that magmas are typically coming from a subducting plate. We know that a volcanic arc is the result of that. And something called the fore arc is this place between the ocean and the arc. And the fore arc is typically a cold place. You're typically not making magmas in the fore arc because you haven't gotten the ocean plate deep enough to generate these melts. There's an angle to the subducting plate, in other words. So fore arcs are cold. Four arcs are not places we make magmas, typically. We have to wait until we get past this area and get to the actual volcanic arc to get this incredible stream of magmas coming to the surface. Well, the modern volcanic arc that we know and love here in the Pacific Northwest goes back about 45 million years. I told you 44 before the break. It's now 45, according to our guest. But we are going back earlier than 45 million years ago to the crazy Eocene. And these stars on Vancouver Island and these stars in the forearc of the Pacific Northwest are magmas. And the question is, what do you do with these magmas? What are these magmas telling us? These are magmas that are too close to the trench to be easily lumped in with a volcanic arc. These are near trench magmas. The oceanic trench is offshore, or even was. We bring in a subducting plate. What's going on? Last comment.
near trench magmas are important to us because they mark where an ocean spreading ridge out in the water is intersecting with the margin of the continent. Let's say it two more times. Near trench magmas in their most classic sense are important to locate and study because the most convenient interpretation of those near trench magmas is we're making magmas so close to the trench in a place that's normally cold because this is a divergent plate boundary where we have hot mantle coming to the surface and we're actually making two ocean plates that are eventually going to be heading down a subduction zone in a trench and yeah we're going to get volcanic arc this is arc here this is volcanic arc here. Those are majestic shield volcanoes in general. But look at what we have right here. At the place where we are subducting a spreading ridge, we get near trench magmas at the coast, and we have something called a slab window where we have more of these funky magmas that are not typical of a subduction zone. So right now we're going to our guest and I have questions for him about the near trench magmas that he has studied with his students, other magmas that he has studied in a slab window, and then in the last 20 years, some of his discoveries have helped him see that there's some funny business happening within the slab window, but we'll save that for January 19th. Okay, 2.38, not incredibly late um, for our guest, but thank you for your patience. Let me take a moment, I've got volume off there, volume off here. The scroll is still happening, so it looks like we're functional. We've got 900 people watching. Our guest is from Tacoma, Washington, and his name hey. is Jeff Tepper. How are you today, Jeff? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. You University. Can <laughs> <laughs> I'm having fun, man. University of uh, Puget Sound geologist, geology professor Jeff Tepper. Um, we tested out the, the tech yesterday, and I think we're doing okay again, right? There's no, you're doing fine on your end with audio? I don't hear any little uh, egg timer this time. Okay, okay, good. <clears throat> well, let's jump right into this, Jeff. Um, first of all, can you give us a little background? Have, I, don't, I didn't post a paper that you've written on this because you've been more busy with, with what over the last 20 years? <laughs> Other projects, no. Well, it's mostly in abstract form at this point. So okay. um, student theses will eventually turn into papers, but it's slow. So you've had uh, over the last 20 years with your geology majors at UPS, how many class projects where you've kind of devoted to these really crazy Eocene magmas? Probably nine, every other fall. For every years. other every other fall for 20 years and what has been the procedure so you go to a different location each time and how do you pick your locations about where you want to sample rock well the first one was totally fortuitous i just wanted to go somewhere on the west side of the cascades in february uh, <laughs> yeah. and so um, that launched the whole thing because we found some adakites which i knew nothing about never heard of them before um, after that all the subsequent projects were um, something Eocene, something that hadn't been studied 
um, in, in terms of modern petrology. So they've been mapped, so we would know where to go. And we did. We don't do much original mapping, but we do um, petrology. So something had been studied before, and then something that was accessible. So had logging roads or some other uh, easy access. So in a weekend, for example, we can maybe take two weekend field trips and collect enough samples to to support the project. So this is great. So have you visited and Sam, can you give us some specific locations in western Washington that you still view as pretty classic near trench magmas? The t okay, now you're breaking up a little bit for me. I don't know about your viewers. Let's uh, uh, <clears throat> kind of a frozen. Am I still breaking up? Your audio is back, but you're a frozen, uh, frozen video. What did we do last I'm not, time? I'm not frozen what I can see. Uh, they're saying no audio for Jeff. Now the audio is back. Yeah, I think they're experiencing the same thing I am. So I've got your audio, but I don't have your video. Um, um, so I'll keep talking. Do I still have audio? Still have audio, but frozen picture. Let, let me, oh, there you go. There you go. Just got all you. All right, back okay. again. Okay, we're back, we're back. Must be all that okay. snow over there in Tacoma, huh? <laughs> uh, it's mostly rain today. Okay, right. <clears throat> um, yeah, so do you, do you have any that you feel fit into this simple narrative before we get a little bit fancy with a couple of other things? So two, the Adakites okay. at Chimicum Rock outside of Port Townsend, okay. and something called the Grays River Volcanics, which are in southwest Washington, north of the Columbia. Two very different locations in Washington is, right. is that, and I don't want to get too fancy right off the bat, but does that mean the, the subducting spreading ridge was that wide or are the ages different <coughs> between those two? Uh, um, the ages are right? different. The ages are different and ridges migrate along the coast. There we so, go. And ridges can be offset by transforms. So you can have actually two um, intersections at the same time. So let me try to keep up with you. So you got some water there. Are you okay with your throat? Oh, yeah. Okay. Ooh, nice mug. Let's see that mug. What, yeah, that mug? that's geologic time. Oh, is that the one with the trilobite in the bottom of it? It is. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so Chima come up by Port Townsend. Do you have a date uh, in your mind? Um, yeah, 47. 47. And then the Grays River... Uh, is, is Grays River Volcanics. That's okay. more like um, high 30s, low 40s. Okay, so younger to the south. A different ridge. You know, okay. Ridge, okay. A different segment of ridge. The ridge. I don't think the ridge was moving southward. Okay, okay. Yeah, I. this one's going to be a little awkward, not between me and Jeff. Jeff's been very helpful uh, over the last couple of years teaching me a bunch of this stuff, but I'm, I'm going to be flirting with certain things and then I'm going to back away because we've got some complicating things that we want to address in a two weeks instead of right okay. now. Um, so in the slab window itself, can you help us compare between if we have a magma related to a volcanic arc and subduction versus magmas that are, what's different about this slab window? It looks like a totally different story. What, what, what are some differences from your world between slab windows and volcanic arcs? Okay, so if you think about what's happening offshore at a spreading ridge, you have magmas coming up from the mantle and those would look like what you would get at a mid-ocean ridge. Yep. Okay, <clears throat> if you move inland, the same thing is happening the source of the magma is below the subducting plate. So in a volcanic arc, the source of magma is above the subducting plate, but in a mid-ocean ridge or a slab window, the source of magma is below the plate. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> as a result, in the area that you've labeled slab window there, you would be more likely to get things that look like mid-ocean ridge basalts. And the only complication to this is that on the way to the surface, those could cause melting of the crust. So you could wind up with both mid-ocean ridge looking things or things that look like melting of the crust. 
you really do have some <clears throat> true mid-ocean ridge basalts occasionally in a slab you could. window? Yeah, because a slab window is just a an opening through the slab into the, um, the asthenosphere, the part of the mantle that is below the lithosphere. Do we have any of those in the Pacific Northwest? <clears throat> I think so. I've never actually... Okay. Well, yes, we have some things like that. Okay. But more common, like the one at Chimicum, that's not a basalt. So how is that? So that's been contained so that's, by some of this continent No, stuff. so that's an adakite. Okay. <laughs> so I know Office. we... <clears throat> All right, so an adakite is a rock that looks chemically like the product of melting of the slab. Okay. So in a normal subduction zone, you don't melt the slab, you melt the mantle. Right. But if it's unusually hot, then you could have melting of the slab. And unusually hot could be triggered by either you're at the edge of the window where hot mantle's welling up from beneath the slab. Yeah. Or if the slab is very young. And we have so, both. And we have, we have both. Yeah. We have both. We have subduction mode. And there is nothing younger than the edge of a slab window because that's zero age. That's, that's a, a, a spreading ridge in which mantle melting took place, magmas rose, but they never solidified because it was hot. That's why you have, a, you have a window, because there was no solidification to make oceanic crust, as would be happening offshore. So if you're busting on an outcrop someplace, you're not, you don't know if you have an adakite right away. It just looks like no, a horn, it looks, horn blend berry. It looks ground. like an andesite yeah. or a daysite. And at what point in your process do you realize it's an adakite that's saying you're at the edge of a window or something? After you've analyzed it chemically. And what do you so see the, in that analysis? Uh, element ratios that tell you. So we use the ratio of strontium to yttrium. So two of my favorite elements. <laughs> um, and that ratio tells you what minerals were present in the rock that was being melted. And so if you're melting the subducting plate, one of the minerals that should be in there is garnet. And garnet has a very distinctive fingerprint. So if you see that fingerprint, then we can call that an adakite. The garden wouldn't, is it possible the garnet is from some sort of uh, rock in the continental crust that the magmas are heating up? Um, it is possible. So garnet is forms at higher pressure. So if you have thick crust, you can get garnet in the lower crust, which has nothing to do with subducting slab. It's just because the crust is thick. So you have to be careful yeah. when you interpret that. But if you're thinking about some place like Chimicum, which is way out at the edge of the margin of the continent, that's not a place with a thick crust. Well, you've got a place in Port Townsend. Do you drive right by this Chimicum site all the time? Yeah. What What's a place in the Chimicum it, area that somebody could visit? See this? It's, it's called Chimicum Rock or it's also called Tomonomous Rock. It's, it's a spectacular monolith. Uh, it was a, a, a sacred site to the indigenous the Chimicum people. It now is overseen. It's a, a, a nature area that's overseen by the Sklalem tribe. So it's, it's still um, protected by the local tribe. And there's a, it, it's a climbing destination. I'm not sure what the rules are about climbing there now, but it's a spectacular monolith. It has, it's a, an ash flow. So what's your guess for the year that you went with there with a couple of students and sampled, and what was your motivation to go there? Well, we knew that it was an adakite already. You did? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't even know about it, uh, Chimicum Rock initially, and we were actually out on the road, and some guy came down his driveway and said, do you know about Chimicum Rock? You should, you know, <laughs> walk down the, the next, you know, take the next path to the left, and so... Uh, there was this magnificent outcrop. <laughs> so that was that was a class project in 2004, I think. Okay. And you got hot on the trail and you started looking for other spots or how about your other your, your other breadcrumbs kind of in the slab window? Did you have a general strategy? It was mostly a time-based strategy. So okay. once the Eocene became an interesting time interval, then, you know, look at a geologic map, see what uh, Eocene units are out there. So we mostly worked east of the Cascades, not in the Cascades. Some of both, but it, 
outcrop is better if you're not in the west side of the Cascades. So yeah. Would... yeah. So you followed this slab window as far east as where? Uh, northern Idaho. Northern Idaho. And that's why we, we are saving that until two weeks from now. So you, you started visiting between northern Idaho and your campus, basically, and, and just started, you tried right. to stay confined to the slab window, basically? Well, it, I actually don't think it's a slab window anymore. Hello, so, hello, hello. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a rollback story that we'll talk about. Okay, but it, okay. it, it, it's similar in that it's a place where the slab was missing. Yeah, I, I so so let's get rid of window, but let's let's get the idea that we have to have hot mantle coming shallower than it should be in right. this pink area, correct? Correct, right. And and that means that if we're older than forty five million years ago and we're in this wedge, we can't have subduction related arc magmas between forty five and fifty. I say, yeah, between 52 and 45, something 52 like that. And 45. Yeah. So in that, okay. in that interval of time, normal subduction was not taking place Okay. in, in northeastern Washington. Well, I want to do two more things with you, I know for sure. And then if you've got more time, Jeff, we'll go to some questions from, from the, our live viewers. But I, I, this is breaking news, so I got a couple of excellent emails from you yesterday. I got a couple, I got one email in particular from Jamie McDonald from mm -hmm. Florida, uh, Florida Gulf Coast University who's been out here working on some of these rocks and you guys have collaborated on a couple of posters mm -hmm. or papers or something. Yeah. Um, so between Jamie McDonald and Jeff Tepper, our guest today, I kind of had an about face last night and this morning, I drew it out. So I thought most of these places, wait, can you still hear me? I, I can hear you. So if you're watching in Norway, this is not going to make a whole lot of sense, of course. But um, I thought many of these places that I keep hearing about, and some of our students here at Central Washington University are from these places, like, yeah, I hike up at Pilchuck all the time, or Mount Persis, or uh, some of these drunken Charlie. I don't. I, nobody's talked about that. But anyway, um, what I have written out, and I don't know how much Jeff is going to like this. I'm springing this on him. But this is between J Jamie's email and Jeff's email. I first of all wanted to just kind of potentially group some of these Eocene magmas in western Washington. So we're in the Four Arc basically, but we're in the foothills maybe of the Cascades in some places. The red numbers are obviously ages and millions of years. Uh, Jeff, you want to comment on the groupings first of all? Like you'd, well, let's see. You, from your email, you said Bald Mountain and Mount Pilchuck. You thought were, were pretty clear near trench magmas. No. So what we, what we talked about <laughs> yesterday. So what is what makes this difficult is that yeah, at least three different tectonic settings produced magmas in the same place, not at the same time, but essentially in the same place of Western Washington. In this, in this general place here. So from that place westward, as far as the, the Cascade foothills, I guess I would say. Eastward, yep, okay. Eastward, okay, yep. so, so my criteria for telling them apart is partly geographic and partly age, but generally not composition. Okay. So That's... I would, so I would say that things very far to the west, like you've drawn on the board, which would be the Atakites at Chimicum or the Grays River Volcanics, those are, those are near trench magma type things. And those would be associated with a spreading ridge or some other heat source, probably has to be a spreading ridge, a heat source that is underneath the edge of the continent. Yeah. And so those are not all the same age, but they're and they're very different in composition. But their geography is the defining criteria, as well as what's up in Vancouver Island. Right, those are right, also yep. pretty. So those are those are three places that are all at the edge of the continent, very different in composition, not the same in age, but the same in process. Yeah, 
So those stars along the west there, so the ones on Vancouver Island, Port Townsend, uh, the Bremerton Hills, and all those things are way to the west and are probably um, near trench magmas. Yeah, yeah. And, and viewers, there is a paper waiting for you at nickzentner.com. I'll show it. Oh, no, you know how to get there. You, you go to nickzentner.com, you click on Eocene, and you get to a paper by Madsen, 2006. And, and they, they're, they're Canadian, so they're really showing a bunch of the details up there, which, again, are pretty classic near-trench magmas that fit with the most basic version of this story. But I guess what I'm getting to with Jeff is that he's realizing that, and that's about what I think you're about to say, Jeff, that once you get a little bit further east into the foothills, you're also getting a little bit younger, and therefore it's more of an early days of a cascade arc, well, it's, it's, it's two things. That's the, that's the challenge. So okay. the rollback story that we'll talk about later yeah. was associated with ultimately break off of the slab, as was as you showed in the in the cartoon of India colliding with Asia. Yeah. So that break off also is another opportunity because you've broken the subducting plate. That's an opportunity for a hot mantle to come welling upward and you can get another you get a linear chain of, of igneous activity. Yeah. So I think that's happening. And that's what I would attribute Bald Mountain and Mount Pilchuck to. Okay. So, so, so things that are in the sort of 51 to 48 million year time window, those are too old to be part of the modern Cascades. Yeah. They're kind of far inland to be near trench magmas. Right. But they define a linear belt that comes from down by uh, Rainier up as far as um, Mount Pilchuck and Bald Mountain. So I make I, I attribute those to break off of the slab after the accretion of Silesia. Do you, I'll put you on the spot, do you like any of these correlations between volcanic center and uh, plutonic magma yes. system feeding it? What do you, which yes. do you like? I like Hanson Lake and Granite Falls. Okay. But see, those are similar in age, whereas Bald Mountain and Pilchuck are older. Right. And those and Pilchuck and Bald Mountain are also they're different in terms of their mineralogy. They look like a different source of magma. Okay. Okay. And then I'm I'm quite happy with Young's Creek. Uh, I don't know much about Drunken Charlie, but <laughs> I, I mean I've heard of it, but I don't I've never been there. We don't talk um, about him at family reunions, by the way. <laughs> He's in the corner. <laughs> But yeah, th those being feeders for Mount Persis is, is fine. And those I would um, associate with the beginning of the Cascades. Okay. Yeah, this, this, this is just what I was hoping for, but it's also my fault for trying to shoehorn us into this, this uh, part of the story because it all kind of flows together, I'm starting to realize as I'm talking to you. So some that watched the Geology 351 sessions last spring, you know about Jeff's um, other part of the story where we break a plate twice, we have a rollback of a plate, and that's all happening in this area where we have this unusually hot um, mantle surging. But we're gonna, we need to do some, I'll say it, we need to do some tomography before we get to that. So we're gonna get, be getting into some crazy uh, geophysics uh, before we visit with Jeff again. Um, I would add one thing I learned please, at the please. beginning of class today. So when you were talking about the distinction between the Cretaceous flare-up and the Eocene flare-up and, and posing the question, are these different? And you pointed out that the uh, Cretaceous event is associated with compression, whereas the Eocene is with extension. I think two other things you could note that are different. Good. <clears throat> One is, is the, the great width of activity in the Eocene, <clears throat> extending all the way into Montana, yeah. whereas the Cretaceous event seems to be much less broad in terms of, of distance inboard from the margin. You're thinking of plutons, <clears throat> Cretaceous plutons? I'm thinking of the ones in that time window. Yeah. Uh, they don't extend as far... Well, I guess unless you want to include the Idaho Bathlet and things, but in terms of the ones that seem to be uh, the focus of, of the 
dream team project. They don't yeah. they don't go nearly as far. And then just the overall distance inboard. So the North Cascades plutons are much closer to the edge of the continent where you'd expect to find subduction related activity, whereas the Eocene rocks are unusually far inboard and harder to attribute to subduction. So there's there's some compositional differences maybe, but there's also geographic differences. I like that. I like that. Was there another difference or that was the main thing? Well, those are the two I put stars yeah. next to. Yeah. Okay. The other ones, you mentioned this, the, you know, compression or transpression versus transtension. That's another one. And you're also a huge uh, crust thickness person as far as, um, I know this has come up with you, even within the Eocene maybe, that when we're, if we have a spreading ridge beneath uh, the Pacific Northwest, we are actively thickening the crust in the Eocene. Uh, we're, between... we're, we're thinning the crust in the Eocene. Was there any thickening, though? There was. Oh. Earlier in the Cretaceous, there was thickening. Okay. But in the Eocene, there is thinning. Okay. Associated with extension. So you know of no, um, like an, while we're accreting Silesia, you know of no plutons from the actual accretion, is that even a dumb question? Like No, um, uh, I would say that there are plutons that are the same age as the accretion, but that doesn't mean that they're a, a consequence of crustal thickening. I right, guess. right, good. Um, okay, top of the hour, we have uh, more than, oh, about 900 watching. Let's do some, a backcountry, Gary's with us. Thanks, Gary, for being with us and Ivana and a bunch of familiar names. I assume you can't see any of these uh, questions scrolling by, Jeff. And um, maybe I'm, I'm on a different. I'm on a, I'm on a different platform than you are. Maybe okay. but I can see. I think I can see them. Well, um, it's your call, Jeff, on how you want to operate. I, I typically just sometimes they they go by so fast. Veteran viewers, you know that when you want to ask a question right now, please caps lock, uppercase, and it'll be easier for me to see your questions. And I'll just okay. Well, I see. I see one. Good. Like how how do Goebel and Northcraft fit into this? Oh yeah, how yeah, those, yeah. So those are two um, volcanic units in Southwest Washington. The Northcraft is now, I think, the oldest dated expression of the modern arc. So. Um, Nick was, <clears throat> Nick was saying at the beginning that there were, we pushed the age for the beginning of the Cascades back to 45 million, and that's because of dates on the Northcraft. So um, Michael Polins and company, who are the, the geologists for Washington Geological Survey, who map um, quads every summer, have done some dating of that, and that's where those came from. And the Goebel is another huge volcanic pile in southwest Washington, which has not really been worked on a lot. I think that is also the beginning of the Cascades, but there's sort of two units there, and the lower one doesn't look much like an arc. So that actually might record the transition from something that's prior to the modern arc to the inception of the arc. So I actually have some samples that were we've sent off to be dated, and we'll see if what they come back to be. But both of those, I would say, are, are more related to the beginning of the Cascades than they are to any of the other processes we've talked about. Well, I feel like I want to ask the same question that feels like I'm asking every time I talk to you, but like, how are you so sure that it's Cascade versus not Cascade? It's not a chemistry difference or it is? Well, it, it, so for that, there are th sort of three criteria. Where is it? Yep. How old is it? Right. And, and what is its composition? So the Cascades, being subduction zone magmas have a, a characteristic suite of geochemical fingerprints. What makes that slightly challenging is that if you say go to Eastern Washington, where there has been, it's been a very long history of subduction in the Northwest. So there are old subduction related rocks there. If those are remelted by a later event, Oh my God, you will inherit that subduction seasoning. <laughs> so it, I like that. So it, you know, it looks, tastes, smells like an arc rock, but it's not. It's a. So that's where the, the age and the location and something. Of, and in the case of, of the Eocene, the association with extension and other things that don't look like subduction 
help you to sort out that although the, the in hand sample or in chemistry, it looks like it's subduction related. It probably isn't. And I guess I want to ask one other thing before we go back to the viewers. Sorry, viewers, I'm hunking your, hogging your time again. Yeah, someone said the chemical flavor of subduction lingers for a while. That is totally true. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Um, if you got something that clearly is not subduction related, are we sure it's a spreading ridge underneath there, or can it just be the mantle plume itself? Well, mantle plume has a distinctive set of traits. So we, we should be able to tell that from, from a mid normal mid-ocean ridge. Okay. So one of the reasons that we think that Silesia was formed by the Yellowstone hotspot being parked under a spreading ridge is that there's a combination of those two sets of characteristics sort of intermingled so you couldn't really explain Silesia solely by a spreading ridge, but you also probably would hard to have a harder time explaining it solely by a hotspot. So those those are two flavors of, of, of lavas that, that show up in an ocean setting away from a continent, but there you can tell them apart. But to follow up with that, I'm sorry, I got to ask it. So we're, we're out of Washington now, and maybe you're not feeling comfortable. But down in Oregon, I guess I've been teaching that the Yahats and the Silets and all that are, that's North America going right back over the mantle plume at right. a younger time. That can't be spreading ridge that far south? Well, so, no, so spreading ridge... Because spreading ridges can have offsets on them. Yeah. So if you if you draw a spreading ridge and then have it step um, to the south on yep. transform, you can have a, you can have a new spreading ridge intersection point to the south. So you sort of keep re up the overall the Pacific plates are moving northward relative to North America. So a spreading ridge intersection, a slab window, should move northward up the coast over time. But every time you have a transform, you can reset it, jump it back to the south again. Yeah. So I think there's there's been a, a fair bit of that, which is kind of necessary to keep the ridge parked in the northwest. But if you didn't have some kind of resets, it would have migrated into Canada. Yeah. Well, that that's what we're going to hit pretty hard on your return, your triumphant return uh, to the series uh, in mid-January, where you've got these offsets on your ridge and so let's see and everything else and the rollback but i i gotta confess to you that this migrating uh triple junction essentially where the spreading ridge is is subducting that's appealing to me and i want to continue to to think about that and um so i'll, I'll leave that alone I'm, I'm hugging i'm hugging the time you're, you're always so great at answering these questions thank you do you have another one or should i grab a couple no you can grab Okay, uh, Geneva says, what are the geochemical fingerprints of a mantle plume? They're mostly isotopic. So the, the powerful thing about an isotope ratio is that it's inherited from whatever was melted and it's not affected by crystallizing or the amount of melting or anything else. So I, the analogy I've used in class is that if you melt chocolate ice cream, you get melted chocolate ice cream. It doesn't change flavor, whereas when a magma crystallizes, the elements that are there, it's, it's amount of iron or it's amount of magnesium, those things change. So you, you don't necessarily see what was in the, in the initial melting event. Yeah. So when you melt deeper inside the earth, you get magmas that are isotopically different from the ones that are melted shallower and hot spots and plumes are tapping into this deeper place so they don't look the same isotopically as a mid-ocean ridge basalt, which is melting a shallow place. And in the big in the big picture of cool, you know, planetary scale stories, I think many people would would buy into the idea that the reason that hot spots are isotopically different is because they are sampling crust that was long ago subducted and is now coming back up again on a sort of 200 300 million year cycle wow that's a mind blower so yeah well related to that the device nine says are we ignoring the hot spot in the room 
And you and you're saying you mean Yellowstone? Yellowstone? Yeah. So you're saying that we don't see those signatures in a lot of these a lot of these guys. Correct. Interesting. Um, in part because those guys aren't come they're, they're not coming from the mantle. All those those are crustal melting things, so we don't see very clearly what was coming from deeper below the crust. But Wells says these are so those are basalts. So those those are coming from directly from the mantle, and those give us then a window into what was what part of the mantle was melting. But if we stray into andesites and things that are are not directly come from the mantle, then we lose our our window. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm scrolling back in time, and I'm seeing a bunch are asking kind of what we're talking about right now, Bob. Uh, asked are the Tillamook and Yahats magmas part of the near trench magmas and we're saying no. The, the Tillam Tillam um, yeah the Tillamook I would say is. is. It's a, it, a Tillamook is, a, is one of these things that is younger than Silesia so they're basalts right but they were erupted after the accretion was over. Well that's what I was trying to say earlier that yes uh, we, we know Tillamook and I think Yahats and mm -hmm. another one I can't remember. Uh, they're like, what, mid 30s or, or right. 40s right. or whatever. Right. And isn't Ray saying that's because Selezi was added mm -hmm. and then Selezi is now riding in the front right. of North America and going right back over, but it's going over a hot spot, not, a, not an ocean well, splitting it's, ridge? It's, it's going over this. By that point, it's, I think it's kind of a diffuse. So there's a there's the center of the hot spot, and that's going to be the purest right flavor signature. Yeah. signature, right? Yeah. But then toward the margins of that, it's incorporating shallower mantle, and it becomes a more uh, diffuse or less concentrated signal. So it becomes hard to to see the plume component or the, the hot spot component. So I think those rocks have some of that component, but not as strongly as earlier on, because mm -hmm. where it's where the, 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 their relationship to the low center of the plume is offset more. This is fun. Uh, how about a few more? Uh, go ahead, if you got one. Uh, was, well, I scrolled fast, something about Medicine Lake. Medicine Lake is a shield volcano, yes. And it's, it's part of the Cascades, so it's, it's fairly young. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm editing like I want to save some of this for January 19th or whatever the hell it is when you come back. I shouldn't have set it up this way, probably. Actually, you know what, Jeff? Let's let's um let's tease your return appearance. So I um for the next three shows, we're going to be looking at the Earth's interior and looking at ocean plates that have subducted and we can find them down there and do some kind of restorations. Okay, that's going to be challenging, but that's not your game. But I think it's important to do that because then we are going to come back to you and essentially go east of the Cascades and follow, you don't want to call it a slab window. What do, what do you want to call it? What? An anomalously hot area. I, I, I don't. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna say that each of those lines you drew is the edge of a slab window. One was to the south and one was to, went to the north. So a slab window is sort of like a zipper that separates, if you think of the subducting plate as having segments that are separated by slab windows. A slab window allows one portion of the plates to move, let's say, roll back independently of the one to the adjacent to it, north or south. So on your diagram, I would say that rather than having the two lines converge at the margin, I'd have them be more sort of parallel to one another.
and then each yeah so those are those are each those are two different slab windows the one to the south would be the fair oh one. oh okay the what? one to this yeah seriously this is yeah the one to the south is is probably the Farallon Resur uh, resurrection ridge or window and the one to the north is the resurrection Kula you can't see that shit and the, and, the, and the orientation of the resurrection is probably quite different than you've drawn but the, the the main idea here is that in between those two windows okay in between those two windows is eastern washington and we're all, that's where all the chalice action is happening Well, including the North Cascades. Right, the North Cascades is, is farther west, but it would it would be in that yes. So I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning of this session, I'm always trying to bring things back to the North Cascades, and you haven't necessarily directly sampled, or maybe you have, in the no, North no, no. Cascades. Nothing that you've talked about today. Okay. Except the golden horn. But the I have. golden horn you have. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll, I might see if we can explore your story in two weeks and how it might fit in with what we know and what we don't know about those plutons in the North Cascades that are Eocene in age. But regardless, your story is amazing as it is, and we need that tomography background. And so that's, I think why the layout of this might yeah. work and i think your one of your next guests will talk about the resurrection plate and i think that will be really helpful i think you're right mm -hmm. uh anything else that you grabs your eye I'm, i feel like i want to ask one more of these guys questions i'm coming down to live now uh I don't understand this question. I'm going to read it anyway. Marin says, does the plume-induced subduction initiation model fit into this? So I actually, I don't really care for that model. Oh, uh, what is it? What, what is the model? <clears throat> well, the, the challenge is that we need to, after, this, if, after the collision of Celestia, the subduction zone needs to shift from being on the east side of the Olympics to the west side. Okay. Okay. So, for in, order, in order for the Olympics to be accreted, they were riding on a plate, and the subduction zone must have been to the east. Yeah. After they're accreted, the subduction zone is to the west. Okay. And the question is, how do you? Uh, let's just say jumping first. How does the subduction zone jump? Okay. I've been westward? guilty. I've been guilty of that. Yeah. Okay. So, one of the challenges in this case is that the oceanic crust is very young and very hot because we're right next to a spreading ridge. And if it's young and hot, it, it's not really subductible. You can't, you can't easily initiate a subduction zone if the subducting oceanic plate is young. So one idea um, has been presented is that the plume, presence of the plume weakened the subducting plate and allowed it to um, somehow adjust its, its position. Um, I have a, a different idea in which we move an already subducting portion of the Farallon plate, which was under California, but it's all moving northward over time, that it just gradually moves in from the south. Yeah. And you don't really need to initiate new subduction, you just move an existing subduction system northward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're back to it. We're back to migrating triple junctions. and. Um, that's a big part of it for me, especially since I'm associated with Mike Eddy, who has kind of an against the grain view of this, which we'll save for another session. But I want to explore that kind of stuff the best I can. Hey, you were great, as always. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And uh, you mean it? You'll come back in a couple of weeks? Anytime. Okay. I learn a lot every time. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Have a good afternoon. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. We'll see you next time. Okay, sounds great. Bye-bye.
Jeff Tepper, University of Puget Sound in the Tacoma area. He's a University of Washington graduate, did his PhD there in the Cascades, and then has kind of discovered this Eocene world um, during the last 20 years during his teaching career. And I met Jeff just for the first time a few years ago and immediately thought, this guy's different and he's got a lot of interesting work going on with his students. And we didn't get into it that much with him directly, but he's been so busy teaching his students in these class projects and these independent senior theses and that sort of thing that he hasn't published big papers like some of our other guests. And so much of his work I find very interesting, but it's really not out there. And uh, he's hoping to finally write a couple of these big papers and get it out there. But I think at one point I said, what do people think about your ideas? Don't you get a bunch of pushback? He's like, I haven't written the papers yet. They don't even know what I'm, what I'm talking about. So we're a little, uh, I guess, premature or it's a little sneak peek into uh, some work that Jeff is hopefully going to be publishing in the next couple of years. Let's do a couple more. Let's see, did I have any more on the iPad? No, I don't think I did. Let's do a few more questions that maybe I can handle. I don't know if that's possible. But, um, yeah, let's do a few more, just you and I, and then we can sign off for today. Uh, uppercase as usual. I'll scroll back in the meantime and just see if I can grab a couple. Oh, lots of thank you, Jeffs. Ooh, you like that. Good. Um, yeah, a part of this is my fault, I think. You're, you're wanting to make connections between chalice magmas and the Yucatan, the Yucatan. Or tell me more about eastern Washington and how far east do those chalice magmas go? I kind of, I think you got the sense of that during the conversation. I, I kind of put some uh, borders or some hard edges on our discussion. And I did a little back and forth with Jeff over the break saying, how am I going to take your work and fit it into one show? And I realized I just couldn't do it. So this slab rollback and uh, breaking of ocean plates is very exciting to me and potentially very helpful to the Pacific Northwest Eocene story. And there's just not a natural break, ha-ha, uh, place to break that from this discussion. So uh, what I'm trying to say is some of your questions are excellent questions, but I'm purposely not going there now, and it's coming back uh, later. Sorry, Patrick, I must have said something terrible. What else is new? I'm way back now. Trevor, why do near trench magmas stop Flores, Mount Washington, that's up on Vancouver Island, Cooler Resurrection, Fairland Plate, Triple Junction? Okay, we're getting there, baby. We're getting there, Trevor. The next couple of sessions, I think, will work for you. We have some experts that will be with us. Clive, could the spreading ridge and the hotspot come close to each other? Yeah, I, I, I may be off base with this, but I, I think. Pretty much any model I've seen has the mantle plume at a spreading ridge. Like the Yellowstone mantle plume is at a major spreading ridge. Now I gotta say, this surprised me. I, I had the scale totally wrong. I t had the scale totally wrong with Jeff's story of rollback. Again, we're premature with this, but well, I'll just save it, but I didn't realize it was such a small store. Uh, the scale of it was much smaller than I thought. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know if this part is super helpful. As usual, many of you guys are way ahead of me. Like, I haven't learned it yet. Okay, down to live. Kevin, can you discuss a little deeper a resurrection zone? That's coming a week from today. Why couldn't the magmas inboard of Rangelia and Celetsi be part of prior rifting? That's kind of what I'm wondering, Kent. Let's, let's finish with something that's meaningful, to me at least. This is how we'll finish today. This will work. This will work. Oh, this one? No, wait. Wait. Yeah, this one. 
Well, you remember, this is the North Cascades and the three generations of magma flare-ups. And I'm going to eventually come back and hopefully visit each of these. And maybe backcountry Gary has more photos from us uh, from each of these. Of course, we were in this time window today. But these are plutons that are in eastern Washington, northeastern Washington. They're not near trench magmas. But the question that just came in, Kent, I think it was, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not trying to lead us to a place that I know anything about, honestly. I'm, I'm just, you know. Listen, I just killed the power takeoff shaft on manure spreader, all right? I just came in the house just to get warmed up. I'm just asking questions. That's all I'm doing. We obviously know way more about this story, which is roughly 50 million years ago. Boom. Cretaceous fireworks. And hopefully from today's message, you realize that this is an extensional story where these magmas are coming up in something called a slab window, even though Jeff doesn't like that label in the most basic sense. Yeah, from the Madsen paper, we're talking about all sorts of Mantle upwelling triggered melting in the lower crust and having these freaky adakites and other kinds of weird magmas coming up. Pearluminous granites, I don't know what I'm talking about. But we clearly have essentially this hole. We have this place where the crust is thin and these weird magmas are coming up and taking advantage of this window. What I think I'm asking is, is there any of that story down here? If we have a huge, in Mike Eddy's word, very voluminous magmatic flare-up in the Eocene in the North Cascades, is it possible some of these big boys and big girls are also from some sort of slab window and some sort of sub subducting spreading ridge 100 million years ago? And you're like, well, I don't think so. Well, first of all, we're twice as far back. And you know in geology, the more recent we get, the more we know. There's just more stuff that's still with us. It hasn't been eroded or sent back into the mantle or whatever. And we're saving Baja BC till next winter, but what's potentially a major thing that's happened between this and this? Yeah. You take a bunch of rain galley that was docked and you move it almost 2,000 miles. Is it possible some of these magmas that are today Cretaceous in the North Cascades were south of the border, the Mexican border? And if that's true, why couldn't we have a spreading ridge down there? I'm just asking. We're just playing with it. We're just playing with it. Ted Irving. A toast to you. Here's to you for returning to the live stream series called That Crazy Eocene A to Z. Here's to your health in the new year after all the changes to your routines over the last two weeks. Some of us really look forward to a change in the routine and spending time with friends and family. Others, it's very stressful to be out of your routine. So wherever you fall on that spectrum, I hope everything's going well for you and everyone in your community. Here's to our guest today, Dr. Jeff Tepper from University of Puget Sound. Did a great job, Jeff. Thank you for your time.
I thank you for joining us today. Our next session will be this Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. The winter quarter has begun. Oh, I can see it's really snowing outside. All right. Um, so, you know, there's plenty going on. Students in 101, uh, advising students, other things. And I simply mentioned that in addition to that, which is my day job essentially, um, I really enjoy putting these little programs together. And the fact that you're on the other end of the line uh, watching these, whether it's live or in replay, uh, it's just very satisfying. And occasionally I'll get asked, you know, why am I doing this? And it's like, I just enjoy it. It's just satisfying. That's it. That's the end of the story. It's just fun to put this stuff together and then get it out there and then move on to the next thing. So thank you for being with us today and always with these shows. All right. We're done for today. I'll see you Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Goodbye.